Hello, and welcome to our presentation, Learning to Draw, Emergent Communication Through Sketching. My name is Daniela Mihai. And my name is Jonathan Hare. We're both from the Vision, Learning and Control Group in the School of Electronics and Computer Science at the University of Southampton. Firstly, what is emergent communication? It is the study of how agents learn to communicate in order to collaboratively solve a task. Previous research in this space has focused on token-based communication, to some extent trying to model written language. Referential communication games have been used as a playground for studying emergent communication. In a referential communication game, agents communicate by referring to an object or an action. In the example shown on the slide, Alice on the left-hand side has an image of a horse. Bob on the right-hand side has an image of a horse plus a number of distractor images. The objective of the game is for Alice to communicate to Bob which image he should pick. The challenge is that Alice knows nothing about Bob's distractors. They could all be images of horses. So she has to learn to communicate just the right amount of information for Bob to select the correct image. In this work, we replace the traditional token-based communication channel with a visual communication channel by training agents to draw. So the first question is, is this constrained visual communication channel more interpretable? Because we've observed in the past that understanding what is being communicated by the agents can be very, very difficult. In the past, we've also observed that agents will often learn hashing solutions. That is, they will, for example, look at uh, the pixels of an image and generate hash codes and use those as a way of learning to communicate. In this work, we try to avoid that by adding inductive biases to the model during training, uh, which stop this happening and enable a more semantic form of communication. Finally, we want to see if agents trained with self-supervised gameplay can successfully communicate with humans. So we're now going to look at the computational model that we employ. First of all, I'll explain the game environment. Following many other works using referential games for emergent communication, we play a game with images. We have two agents, the sender agent and the receiver agent. The role of the sender is to take an image and to turn it into a sketch. The receiver agent is given the sketch, a number of distractor images, and the target image, which is often the same image that was given to the sender. The receiver's job is to produce a vector of scores, one for each of the distractor images plus the target image. The idea is that it will give the correct target image the highest score. In the paper, we explore three different game, uh, game variants. In the original game variant, we use 99 randomly sampled distractor images um, plus the target image. Now, this is a very hard game. For humans to play this game is nearly impossible. Um, it's a very, very challenging problem. We also use two other types of game. In the object-oriented same game, the images given to the receiver are all of different classes. The target image is the same as the image given to the sender. So in this particular case, you can see here, the class would have been something like boat, um, the receiver would have only had one boat image, and it would have been the same image that was given to the sender. In the third variant of the game, the, the object-oriented different game, the receiver will have an image of the same class as the sender, but not the same image itself. Okay, so it'll be a different picture of a boat. If we look at the overall architecture of the um, agents uh, and look inside them, we can see that they have um, some things in common um, and some different bits. So there are um, a visual system which is common to both agents um, and a task-specific module uh, which is different for each of the agents. In the case of the sender, there's a visual system and a sketch generator. In the case of the receiver, there's a visual system and a module for doing score computation. The visual systems are based on the VGG16 network. Um, we take the VGG16 network, take all the convolutional layers, throw away the, um, the MLP at the end. We use pre-trained weights from ImageNet and for some exper experiments from stylized ImageNet. During training, the weights of these networks are fixed. These networks, in both cases, both agents, are followed by a linear projection. 
which gives us a feature vector to uh, represent each image. If we look inside the sender agent, um, we can see that the uh, role of the sender agent is to, first of all, encode the image into a feature vector, um, and then to decode it into a sketch. One of the biggest challenges for us in this work was to, uh, to actually develop an approach to, uh, to perform differentiable rasterization of vector primitives. We talk about that work um, in our archive preprint, which you can see on the slide. Internally, inside the, uh, the sender agent, the primitive MLP decoder block is responsible for basically taking a vector and turning it into a set of instructions which tell the, the rasterizer where the start point and end points of each of the lines that get drawn uh, are. If we look inside the receiver agent, um, we can see again that there are two parts. There is the visual part, um, which has uh, the VGG16 and the linear um, projection, which is followed by a multi-layer perceptron, um, which transforms the features into a different space. That's then coupled to a module which computes the scores using the inner product. So the dot product between the sketch feature and each of the image features is computed, and this gives us a, a score for each of these uh, each of these images. During training, we use the Atom optimizer, and we train the entire system end to end. All of the experiments in the paper used a multi-class hinge loss. However, we have done experiments with other losses, such as categorical cross entropy, and found that, that works just as well. One of the problems that was mentioned earlier is that sometimes when uh, training these module, models, that they can um, converge to what we call a hashing solution. So that means that they produce images which basically look random, although the communication rate might be quite high. Um, what we found is that we can incorporate a perceptual loss as an inductive bias in order to help um, solve this problem. For the experiments in this paper, we use an, a very, very simple perceptual loss based on computing um, features across the layers of the VGG16 visual system, um, taking the difference of them, norm, the normalized difference of them, um, and computing, um, and, uh, computing the uh, L2 norm uh, spatial average, and then averaging them all together in order to compute a single um, loss variable, which we minimize. Uh, as you'll see in the results, this is very effective. We perform a large number of experiments. In this presentation, we're going to highlight the main research questions and findings. First of all, can our agents communicate between themselves? On the slide, we show results based on STL10 images, with agents being trained in the three different game settings we proposed. We see that when using only the game loss, agents can successfully communicate, but the sketches thus produced do not resemble anything meaningful to a human. When introducing the perceptual loss, however, we can see that sketches start to resemble the input photographs, and that doesn't come at the cost of the agent's communication success rate. Next, we ask if it is possible to pair a sender agent with a human participant. We run a study with human participants in which we ask them to select the target images based on sketches produced by agents pre-trained in different settings. Each human participant is asked to play 30 games in five different game settings. We recorded a total of 1,800 games. On the left-hand side of the slide, you see an example of what the participants were shown. They would see a sketch and a number of images they could select from. In the results, we compare the agent communication rate with a human communication rate. Firstly, we observe that the introduction of a perceptual loss leads to statistically significant improvement in human ability to play the game. We also observe that humans are better at determining the class of the sketch rather than the specific instance. So for example, on the left-hand side, you could have multiple images of an airplane. You might recognize that the sketch represents an airplane, but you might not be sure which of the images is uh, represented in the sketch. And that is what the human class communication rate shows. 
Finally, we ask how a shape bias influences the sketches. On the slide, we present results on experiments run with Caltech and with Celebay. To introduce a shape bias, we replace the visual system with a VGG16 pre-trained on stylized ImageNet. We see that the agent's communication rate is similar in both cases when using ImageNet weights and when using stylized ImageNet weights. However, with a shape bias, sketches produced by the agents start to be visually more correlated with the input images. We run many other experiments. For example, we ask how the model capacity influences the communication channel. Details on this and many other questions can be found in the paper. To summarize, we hope that our work is a step towards exploring visual communication between artificial collaborative agents. We've shown that it is possible to train such agents in a self-supervised end-to-end framework. With the human evaluation experiments, we've seen that it is possible, with the appropriate inductive biases, to induce visibly more interpretable sketches that the agents can use to successfully communicate with humans. So where do we go next? There are lots of avenues for future research. For example, we could improve the drawing, we could add curves, shapes, different colors, for example. We're also interested in improving the model. Currently, we're looking at replacing the VGG16 visual um, feature extractor with a more advanced one based on a pre-trained vision transformer from CLIP. We're also interested in improved understanding, understanding what the groups of lines that have been drawn by the agent actually mean. Do they correspond to objects, for example? Thank you for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this talk. We look forward to taking any questions that you may have. I hope you uh, enjoyed the video uh, for uh, this paper, Learning to Draw Emergent Communication Through Sketching. Uh, we are fortunate to have uh, both authors, Daniela and Jonathan, with us today. Uh, hi. 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 Uh, it's, a, it's, a very, uh, it's a very fun paper, I would say. So uh, my, my, uh, and, and solid, but, but fun. So I wanted to ask first the question, like, where did this idea come from to so actually uh, emergent communication through sketching because the traditional ways are using words or symbols, etc. cetera, explain that in the talk. So why sketching? Uh, well, thank you for the question. Uh, I think um, one of the main motivation was uh, to actually think back of how we start to develop uh, words. I don't think we start by words first. It's actually by visual representations that we start. So um, then how can we actually communicate in a way that doesn't really need uh, any teaching beforehand. So by seeing stuff and recognizing stuff around us, uh, we managed to represent them in drawing. So um, I think this uh, made us think, okay, so uh, is sketching a better way of representing stuff without uh, giving um, the, the other person uh, something to learn before? So uh, they also have a um, a representation about uh, the visual world. So uh, if we share that, can we communicate more easily by that? Thank you. Um, um, so I have a question from the rocket chat. So I will move to that. Um, in the human receiver experiment, how did you choose which image to give to the receiver, to give the receiver to choose from? Okay, so in, in those uh, experiments, the um, the distractor images and so everything but the target was completely chosen randomly. Um, in the different game settings that we experimented with, there were kind of two different options. So in one of the one of the options, um, all of those distractors would have been of a different class to the sender's image, mm -hmm. and in the other option, there was a significant chance that you would get get multiple images of the same same class. But only the uh, only the exact image was the one that matched. Um, so the the latter one's kind of mu much more much more difficult. You might end up with um, the receiver having three pictures of airplanes and having to guess correctly which which airplane it was based on the sketch. Thank you. Okay, uh, so the the question in the rocket chat are starting to come up, so that's why I'm monitoring at the same time. So. Um, a uh, couple of questions there. Did you think of using the sketches to communicate information on a different modality, like sounds? I think <laughs> that's a good <laughs> question, but no, we haven't. Uh... Yeah, I, th I think that that would be a that would be an interesting 
interesting thing to to kind of take from this and, and to to kind of do going forward. Um, you know, in principle, there's nothing stopping us uh, doing that. Um, yeah, and I like think that there's a follow-up. So these are actually a couple of questions that were asked by the same person. Uh, do you think the information represented in drawing can communicate information that cannot be communicate, communicated be, with words? Maybe to your first point, Daniela. Uh, so I think if we think back about children, they start drawing stuff or doodling before they actually know how, the name of the things. So maybe we, we can, I think, yes, there is more flexibility in the way we represent, uh, we communicate about stuff in, draw, in drawing uh, and sketching than in language. Yeah, um, maybe my last question, I will see if we have time for one last, uh, which is a question from the Rocket Chat, but I also have a, uh, I had a, a similar one. While the, the, from the Rocket Chat, while the perceptual loss encourages visual closeness to a real sketch, how can you exclude that the communication between agents is not still based on some other encoding of the image, like the number of lines or this kind of stuff? And I think my, my, my related question was about, um, so the, the sketches uh, are used also as a bottleneck for information. We know in this emergent communication game, the bottleneck is very important. Can you control this bottleneck? Uh, and how do you do that? Okay, so, so we'll start with the, the, the second part of the question. Um, yeah, so we can control the bottleneck in a few different ways. So we can control the complexity of the sketch, how many lines. Mm -hmm. uh, in principle, we can change the um, parameterization. The, yeah, the number the number of degrees of freedom of the lines. So we in the, in all the experiments in the paper, we just use straight lines. Um, although actually, I think there's some there's some points. Yeah, so experiments. we've also explored with points, curves, uh, but there's yeah more flexibility in the way things are being rasterized. Um, the the first part of the question. So the perceptual loss will try and make the features of the sketch match the features of the image across the layers of a, of a deep CNN. Um, I think it's an interesting question as to whether that's the correct approach to take. Um, so we actually have some follow-up work. We're presenting in a, a paper um, next Monday in the um, Shared Visual Representations Workshop um, where we actually explore that a little bit more. Um, so perhaps, perhaps that, that's where starts it there. Um, yeah. I think that's, uh, that's, the best, uh, that's the best advertisement for the, <laughs> for the workshop. Yeah, yeah. I encourage you also to post the link of the workshop in the Rocket Chat so that people can actually uh, go and check it out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much uh, for this uh, discussion and, uh, and for this great paper. I think uh, I might expect a lot of questions coming from the Rocket Chat. Uh, so please look it up.